For the longest time, I couldn't look at it. I was in denial about climate change for longer than I care to admit. Told myself the science was too complex, that the environmentalists were dealing with it, that it wasn't my issue. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. If you're talking about climate change, you're talking about sharing a common atmospheric space. That common atmospheric space has already been filled up with emissions by a piddly little population of the rich of the world. That is inequality. If that is not fixed, we don't fix the problem of climate change. Once I began to look, I was struck by how wealth and power have shaped every aspect of our response to this crisis. And not all of us are equally responsible. In the shadow of the Arctic Circle lies Alberta, Canada's massive forest, undisturbed for 10,000 years until now. It's oil, a sticky, tar-like oil called bitumen. What they would do first is they would log off all the timber. They bring dozers in and they strip the overburden is what it's called. So they will strip all the, the subsoil, the topsoil and, and the clay off of this. Then they get down into the bitumen. Sometimes it can be 30 or 40 feet down, even further. We're now hitting really extreme and difficult resources and have much higher environmental footprints and much higher carbon emissions. I've lived my whole life in Canada. I think of the tar sands as the whole at the center of my country, an undertaking so vast and violent that we have trouble looking at it. It has changed us, this great machine that pretends to turn nature to its will. Canada's government recently threw out decades of environmental law to remove all remaining breaks on tar sands expansion. Oil companies developing the oil sands are paying billions of dollars. I mean, in fact, $22 billion a year are going into the government coffers from resource development overall. It's benefiting every part of the country. You make about four grand a week, and that's too much money, man, too much. I work half the year and make about 150. Grossness. That's why we're here on a, what's today, Tuesday, Wednesday? Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday. Tuesday, Wednesday, drinking at a bar, man. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be learning things, keeping it real, but <laughs> you make mistakes, right? You're young, you learn, you step. It's good stuff. It's the money that brings everybody here. In the long run, it's not because I think everybody loves what they do. They're losing a lot. If you look at the rate of divorce or separations when people move out here to work, it's huge. You see it in people's faces like, because they're leaving their families behind. We said you can use the land to the depth of a plow. Anything beyond that is our responsibility. And we use those words because when these people came over, they wanted to own the land. We don't believe that. That's why in this treaty, there's no, there's no talk about ownership. We will always have an inherent right to the land. We will always be able to hunt, fish, and forage the same as we did yesterday, the day before that, and the day before that, and we'll be able to do that tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that. Just in the past little while, like a, a month, there's just been like one spill after the other. Hi. My name is Krista Lehman, and I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. I got a report that there was a spill out on the Primrose site. I can't give you access. This is the Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional hunting territory, it. and it's I, my constitutional I right. It. I respect it. You need to get a hold of Mr. Dick Brinkley. Okay. He's the range activities officer and the First Nations liaison officer for the Canadian Forces at Four Wing Pole Lake. Wing up, Dick Brinkley. Hi, Dick. This is uh, Crystal Lehman calling, and I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. Uh, I'm also sitting here with uh, one of the leaders of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. 
we would greatly appreciate the opportunity um, to just go out and, and be able to put our minds at ease over um, what what is happening out there currently. Well, uh, you do not have an access agreement. So in reality, uh, there's not, nothing I can do for you from that point of view. How do we go about getting an access agreement? I, I would direct you to, to speak to Alberta Environment. AER. I know who AER is. Right. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What can one person do? One person can do a lot. The environmental impacts of the development in the oil sands is absolutely barbaric. Put two and two together and you feel physically directly responsible for affecting somebody else's health downstream. I do not support shutting down the tar sands tomorrow by any means. What I support is a transition over to a renewable energy source. The renewable energy industry would employ exactly the same workers that the oil sands does. Using some of the money that is made up there, we can build 20% wind, we can have 20% solar. All of these things are going to benefit oil sands workers and our society. As fossil fuel companies drive into new territory, their pipelines and export routes are connecting communities along the way. The metal pathways of dirty energy mapping a new organic web of resistance. This latest wave of direct action is, in a way, the birth of a new territory. Some call it Blockadia. So, it's the first night being here in this pipe. You see the incredible transformation that happens. They become stronger, they stand up. Isn't this the society we want? Recent years have been filled with surprise rebellions. These moments are rare, and that means they must leave more behind. New laws, new systems, new deals. I think climate change can be the catalyst we need, our common lens. We are all, we are all part of this movement. Part of this movement. What if we realized that real disaster response means fighting inequality and building a just economy? That everyone working for a healthy food system is already a climate warrior. So too are people fighting for public transit in Brazil, housing and immigrant rights in the United States. When there are movements battling austerity in Europe, extraction in Australia, pollution in China and India, environmental crime in Africa, and the bad trade deals that lock in all of these ills everywhere. I believe the movement we need is already in the streets, in the courts, in the classrooms, even in the halls of power. We just need to find each other. One way or another, everything is going to change. And for a brief time, the nature of that change is still up to us. Thousands of Chinese miners are involved in an illegal gold rush that's stripping the country of a precious resource. 